Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here today to speak to you about something that's getting a lot of attention recently in the literature. I have nothing to declare. So basically what I'd like to cover today are these topics. When we talk about hypothalamic inflammation, what are we talking about? Second of all, the participation of glial cells or gliosis in this process of inflammation. What are the causes? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about dietary and hormonal signals that can cause this inflammation. And how does this affect metabolism? So first of all, when we talk about um, inflammation, what are we talking about? I think that's one of the problems we're having right now because when we start to talk about something that's so um, widespread, inflammation, it can be some, it's basically the body's response to harmful stimuli. So that can be almost anything that can cause this inflammation, and it can be either acute or chronic. So what we're seeing is that the type of stimulus, the different cell types that are responding to this stimulus, how long we're um, exposed to this stimulus, and as well as the degree of stimulus will all influence this inflammation. And of course, the outcome is going to depend on these underlying causes and the type of stipulation and the degree of stimulation. So we've known for a long time that neuronal inflammation is involved in other inf um, diseases in other parts of the brain, but it's only recently, in the last few years, that we've started to concentrate on what's going on with neuronal inflammation in the hypothalamus. And actually, the first study that I'm aware of was published a decade ago. It came out of this Brazilian lab of Dr. Veioso, where they showed that an animal, a, a rodent that's on a high-fat diet, in this case it was 16 weeks, they found that there was an increased production of uh, inflammatory cytokines, as well as the, the local um, concentrations of inflammatory cytokines. And this activated the classical um, pathways of inflam inflammation. They went on to show that if you blocked these pathways, they were able to block some of the secondary effects of the increased weight gain on this high-fat diet. So therefore, these animals became more insulin-sensitive when they block these inflammatory pathways. And a lot of people have gone on to show this, where you can have this hypothalamic inflammation that seems to be very coordinated with the insulin sensitivity or causing insensitivity at the hypothalamic level, and that can go on to be part of the secondary complications of obesity. Now, this can be caused by a number of different things. Out of Dr. Um, Dongsheng Kai's lab, they, they have done a lot of work in this, that these, these pathways that are involved not only in metabolic um, responses, but also in aging. And they show, have shown, I've taken this from one of his um, reviews, that it's a very good diagram of all the different things that can be involved with this um, hypothalamic inflammation. And as I said, most of the time, what we're talking about is the activation of these classical inflammatory pathways. So this can be caused by a number of things. The, Cytokines themselves can activate the receptors, activate these pathways, activate a number of different um, inflammatory response genes. And this is a feed-forward system where this also causes more cytokine production and more inflammation. This can also be activated by um, nutrients themselves acting on toll-like receptors or entering into the cell and causing um, endoplasmic reticulum stress, also causing, um, affecting autophagy, a number of different processes that are all going to feed into the same pathway. So when we're talking about hypothalamic inflammation, in general, we're talking about a number of different processes. It's for this reason, I think that we don't really understand it very well yet, exactly what's going on. But the, the basic, or the bottom line, is that if we block this, this, these pathways, we can block a lot of the um, secondary effects that are downstream, such as disrupted energy homeostasis or obesity, type 2 diabetes, and even some of the cardiovascular homeostasis can be um, renewed. So what we're trying to understand is what are the signals that are actually activating these different processes, what cells are involved, and how are these cells are involved, and how can we inhibit this process, or can it be reversed? So 
When usually when we talk about the neuronal circuits involved with metabolic control, we tend to concentrate on, on these two um, neurons, types of neurons, the NPYA GRP neurons and the POMC neurons. And of course, they are very important. And if we actually block um, the inflammatory processes in the NPY neurons, the, you can improve metabolic control. And recently, it's been shown also that blocking some chemokines in these neurons can also improve metabolic control. So we know that the neuronal inflammation is very important. However, these neurons are not alone. And most of the time, we forget about all of the um, glial cells that are surrounding these neurons. And actually, it's these glial cells are our first line of defense. They're the first cells that are going to respond to most of these um, toxins or, or dangers that our neurons are exposed to. So actually, the same Brazilian group uh, went on to show that the microglia are actually involved with this process uh, in response to the high-fat diet. So they are producing these cytokines in, directly in response to a high intake of, of fatty acids. And we know that the, the microglia are actually the macrophages of the brain. And they are our first line of defense. They're usually the first cells that respond to any of these um, dangerous subject, um, processes. And also we know that the microglia, their response depends on the resting response, or the resting phenotype. So the microglia are usually defined as either M1 or M2, but actually there's an array of different types of microglia in between, and what they produce can either be helpful or repair the, the um, toxins or the danger or the neurons, or they can be pathogenic. So when we see an, an increase in microglia or an increase in microglial response, it can either be helpful or it can be dangerous. So we need to keep that in mind. And actually, a very recent study, a very nice study just came out showing that this microglia response dictates the response to saturated fatty acids. In they are, this, this study actually says that they're the number one response that's causing the hypothalamic inflammation. But we also know that astrocytes are also involved in these responses. And we, we usually, when you have hypothalamic inflammation, you also have gliosis. And here, when we talk about astrogliosis, um, again, it's something that's very vague. We can say that we have an astrogliosis when we have an increase in number of astrocytes, or we have a change in the morphology of an astrocyte, or even in just what they produce. So again, we're talking about a number of different processes that can be defined very differently. But we do know that astrocytes themselves are also activated in response to a high-fat diet. Now, astrocytes are really interesting cells because they actually express a number of different receptors for uh, metabolic hormones, including leptin, insulin, gluc gluc glucocorticoids, sex steroids, and they also transport a number of these metabolic factors into the central nervous system. So the astrocytes are involved with glucose transport, leptin transport, a, no a number of different um, processes that are going to affect what the neurons see or what the neurons do. They also metabolize glucose and fatty acids, and they store glycogen. So they've sometimes been referred to as the, the livers of the brain. And we know that the astrocytes respond to a number of these factors, changing their morphology, and are involved with the synaptic plasticity, not only in the development of the brain, but also in the adult brain. They control a number of processes in neurotransmission, including neurotransmitter uptake. They secrete um, leotransmitters, so they're directly involved in a number of the um, processes that before were only um, attributed to neurons, and of course, they also secrete cytokines. So any of these um, metabolic factors that are going to affect these astrocytes can affect a, a number of, of different processes that are going to directly affect the neurons. Now, this study was very important when it came out because it showed that there are actually, there's an actually a, a biphasic response to a high-fat diet. Here, out of this, this study out of the, the laboratory of Michael Schwartz, what they showed was that there's a very rapid response 
to a high-fat diet even after one day. So this implies that what we're not seeing is a response to weight gain, because these animals obviously haven't gained enough weight yet here. So there's another, another signal. And then this kind of wanes, and then it comes back a couple of weeks later. So this is a very classical response or, or phenomenon that we see when we talk about glia. The glia actually have a, a rapid response that usually is protective, and then they have a more prolonged response that can actually be um, harmful to the surrounding cells. So this early response was thought probably be due to the diet. And what I want to show you here is that, indeed, we can see this. Um, these are astrocyte cultures from two-day-old Worcester rats, and they're purified. And this here is actually a double labeling for GFAP, which is a marker of astrocytes, and um, EBA1, which is a marker of microglia. And you can see that there's no red. So this means that this is very important that there is no contamination by microglia. So we're working with um, highly enriched astrocyte cultures. And if we treat these cultures with increasing levels of palmitic acid, we can see that we have an increased production of different cytokines. And we actually have a decrease in uh, TNF-alpha. But this implies that there's a direct effect of these um, glial cells to our um, dietary factors. But another very interesting thing is that these are cultures from male mice, two-day-old male mice. And these are cultures from two-day-old female mice. And you can see that the responses are quite different. And of course, at two days old, these, this is not due to the post-pubertal post sex steroid um, levels. So here, we can even see that at basal levels, females and males are quite different in the production of cytokines by their astrocytes. Now, I, I find this important for those of you that have worked with comparing the responses of the males and females. We know that a lot of times the responses are quite different, that females sometimes are more um, less likely to gain weight in a high-fat diet, at least in my hands. And this could possibly be due to just this, that the innate cell um, responses are quite different, at least to the glial cell response. Also, if we combine, or if we use only oleic acid, we don't get this type of response. So obviously, saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids cause different responses. And actually, the combination, we see a, a protective effect of the oleic acid against the palmitic acid. So again, sometimes when we use a high-fat diet, it's very important to know what our concentrations of the different types of fats are, because they don't all re um, cause the same response. And I've used this kind of as a of a, an example of the endoplasmic reticulum response with the unfolding protein response. And you can see here, too, that there's actually a direct response of the fatty acids on the endoplasmic reticulum response. So, what we can say is that astrocytes themselves respond directly to nutrients, and the combination of the nutrients is important. And there's also a sex difference in the response to these nutrients. But also, of course, there are a number of other things that we need to, to look at, um, what happens with carbohydrates, glucose, fructose, um, the combination of metabolic hormones in the, in the um, environment. We've seen that if in these cultures we treat them with leptin, the response to the fatty acids is different. So I think this is another thing that's quite important. Of course, we all know that when we're doing culture experiments, it's isolated and we're only um, looking at one thing. But the same thing happens when we're looking at an animal. There are a number of things that are changing at the same time. And of course, sex steroids. These animals did not have, or they were not post-pubertal, but if we do treat the astrocytes with estrogens, for example, we do have a protective effect against some of, some of these compounds. So there are a number of different things that can activate our astrocytes that are going to have an impact on metabolism. And one of the other things is we're not just talking about astrocytes producing cytokines. Astrocytes, as I said, do a number of different things. And this is one study where we looked at the um, change in the shape or the gliosis of the brain and how that affect neuronal covering. One of the things that astrocytes do is actually they unsheath neurons. And here, 
in this high, um, a study where we fed them a high-fat diet, we had an increased coverage of the neurons in the hypothalamus. Here we had an increased coverage of both PUMC neurons and NPY neurons. And what does that do? Well, actually what it does is leave less area available for synaptic inputs. And indeed, what we saw here was that on the high-fat diet, there was a decrease in the number of synaptic inputs to both NPY and PUMC neurons. And the interesting thing here is that the change in the type of inputs was different. So what the brain actually does, or the hypothalamus actually does, is to modulate the architecture and change the synaptic inputs to the PUMC and NPY neurons so that our output is different. And also, the same type of remodeling changes the coverage of the neurons of the, of the um, vasculature, and that can also possibly change the uptake of the different neurons, of the different nutrients that are going to be um, transported to the neurons. So these changes in architecture seem to be quite important for um, the response to a high-fat diet. And what might this actually mean? But this was a very interesting study where what they did was to um, look at polysialic acid um, a key in the, uh, here the immunoreactivity, and you can see that the polysialic acid actually um, increases in response to a high-fat diet. Well, what does that mean? This is a form of polysialic acid that is important for the ability of the, the, uh, the cells to interact with each other and to change shape. And if we block that ability to increase the polysialic acid by using um, uh, an enzyme that actually is very specific for the polysialic acid, they don't get this remodeling. And what happens is that the normal um, change, when you give an animal a high-fat diet, they have an increased uh, hyperphagic um, period, and then they start to decrease their food intake. Well, actually, that change is less. So these animals actually are less able to adapt to this new um, nutrient environment. So this synaptic rearrangement actually seems to be protective. It's trying to protect the body from um, gaining too much weight and continuing eating a harmful diet. So it is important. But of course, we don't only eat fat. And a lot, most of the studies so far on, on looking at hypothalamic inflammation or gliosis have been done in animals on a high-fat diet. But in this simple study, what we did was to put animals on a high sucrose diet, so just table sugar. We gave them a normal rat chow, but from the time of uh, weaning, they were put on 30% uh, sucrose solution instead of water. So they had an increased intake of, of calories that were due to sucrose. And as you can see, they had a very large increase in subcutaneous fat and visceral fat after two months on this sucrose diet even though their weight actually was less. And they were very hyperleptinemic. Um, what happens with inflammatory response? Well, again, we get, um, this is showing in the visceral adipose tissue here, and we have an increase in, in cytokine production in the visceral adipose tissue, but we also have an increased production of TNF-alpha in the hypothalamus. So if we look at what uh, till now has been called hypothalamic inflammation, we would say that these animals have a, a hypothalamic inflammatory response. But what happens with the glia and with some of these intercellular signaling pathways? Well, again, we have an increase in the number of microglia. So we have a gliosis, is what we would call it, and we're actually activating some of these typical inflammatory pathways. However, we don't see, at this point at least, any change in their glucose tolerance test. So we couldn't call them really insulin um, or glucose um, intolerant at this point. But the story is not so simple. Here we would say that even sucrose would activate microglia and cause hypothalamic inflammation. However, sometimes it depends also on some earlier um, exposition to other factors, and we'll hear about some of that in the next talk, where here what we did was to put these animals in different sizes of litters, and so we would call them neonatal overnutrition. So these animals here 
They were raised in litters of four um, mice or rats, and these were raised in litters of 12. So when we get to weaning, they, are, they weigh more, they continue to eat more, and also the responses to later um, changes in diet is exaggerated, as you can see here. So when we changed them at weaning to a high sucrose diet, they actually had a bigger increase in visceral fat. So what we would expect, possibly, is that they would have a higher increase in hypothalamic inflammation. Well, that's not what we found, actually. We actually found that the number of microglia was normal, even though we had an increase in, in TNF-alpha messenger RNA, and the inflammatory pathways were actually decreased in these animals. So this is, this is just to show that we don't always see a one-to-one -one relationship when we have gliosis, we don't always have the inflammation that we would call inflammation, or when we have the inflammation as expressed in, in production of cytokines, we don't always have activation of these pathways. So this is something that in the literature now is quite confusing, that we don't really have a good definition of what we're all looking at. But one of the things that could be involved in some of these pathways or these problems is actually um, leptin itself. And we know that microglia have leptin receptors in here. This is just to show you that if we infuse leptin ICV, we get an increase in the number of activated um, microglia. And in this um, animal study that I just showed you, actually, we have even higher levels of leptin. So again, we would think that we'd have an increase in, in microglial activation. However, as I told you at the beginning of the talk, the microglia respond differently depending on what their basal state is. So here, if we use a microglial um, cell line and we treat them with leptin, we can see we have a, a dose response again to, um, to leptin to produce interleukin-6. However, if we first treat them with LPS, which we know that activates microglia, and then treat them with leptin, we have a decrease. So here, the basal state is activated, and so we get a decrease in activation of the microglia in response to leptin. So one of the things that might be happening is that because these animals are exposed to a higher level of leptin, their future response to more leptin might change at the microglial level. And this is something, too, that was, was shown recently in this study where what they did was to look at the microglial activation in, this is out of the laboratory of Matthias Schaub, what they showed was that the OBOB mice, where they, we know they're all, they're, they're very heavy due to a lack of leptin, and they have very little microglial activation. So it's not just being overweight. And if you put them on a high fat diet, the response, they have more activation, but it still doesn't reach the, that of a wild type animal. So it's a combination of diet and the existence of factors such as leptin. And indeed, when they treated them with leptin, even though they lost weight, they had an activation of microglia. So there's a nice combination here of, it's not just, it's not really weight dependent. It's an interaction between a number of different factors as well as the, the diet itself. Now, we know that astrocytes also respond to leptin. Indeed, a few years back, we showed that we can change um, astrocyte activation and their um, morphology by giving leptin. And this response actually is different depending on if it's a short exposure or a more long-term exposure, at least in vitro. And this um, response on astrocytes tends, appears to be important for metabolic control. In this study, what we used here were knockout mice where the leptin receptor was knocked out in astrocytes. And as you can see here, the, in the neurons, there was no change in the leptin receptor expression. And what we saw was just like what we saw a, years ago, was the, a few years ago, was that the lack of leptin changes the ar architecture or the morphology of the astrocytes. They have less projections. This means there's less coverage of the, um, here it's just the POMC neurons. And this actually changes their electrical activity and their synaptic inputs. And this changes the response of the animal to leptin and also to other things such as uh, ghrelin and fasting. So what we think actually is happening here is that the leptin is, is working to help fine tune the response through acting on, on astrocytes in addition to a number of other things. But the, 
effects through astrocytes appears to be very important. And this study came out just recently from the laboratory of Dr. Pan from Louisiana. And what they showed in another model of the leptin receptor knockout in astrocytes was that the response to a high fat diet is actually exaggerated. So again, the response through astrocytes is very important. But I wanted to show you rapidly here some results of um, what happens with ghrelin, because we know that, that ghrelin has a lot of the opposite effects on, on different cells as leptin does. And actually, it's been shown that, that ghrelin has effects in anti-inflammatory effects. So what we did was to treat um, animals ICV for two weeks with ghrelin, uh, isolated ghrelin, disacylated ghrelin, and some were treated with GHRP6 as well as a um, anti uh, agonist of the growth hormone one receptor, or the ghrelin one receptor, and then some pear fed animals. And as you can see, we get a nice weight gain response, a nice um, increase in, in leptin. And if you look at what happens here, you can see at the central level, we get a very large increase in some of the cytokines. But this doesn't correlate with what we saw with the weight gain. As you can see here, for example, with the acetylated ghrelin, we could also get an increase in interleukin-6, as well as TNF-alpha, even though there was no weight gain. And we have seen that this is actually a, a direct effect, at least on the astrocytes, so there's a direct effect of deacetylated ghrelin. And again, there's an actual decrease in some of the glial responses. So the one-to-one -one relationship, again, does not hold up. There's an increase in weight, and there's not an increase in, in glial activation. But as you can see here in these, there's actually a, there is a change in the morphology. So a lot of times when we're looking at just some of these markers, um, the overall expression levels, we can't talk about, the, say that there's no effect, because actually I do believe there's some effect here. They become very spindle-like, and this might be changing the actual response of the astrocytes. And the other question is, do astrocytes have the ghrelin receptor? And, well, actually, it's very difficult. If we do some immunostaining, it looks like they might. If we look at the cultures, um, there's a very low level expression. So what we did was to go on and to do some responses of cultures with animals that have the ghrelin receptor knocked out or wild type. And as you can see here, some of the, um, this is a glucose 2 um, transporter that's very highly expressed in astrocytes, is induced by isolated ghrelin in the wild type but not in the knockout. And the same thing happens for this um, glutamate transporter. So it looks like that it, this is probably an effect through the type 1A receptor. And again, if we went back to our rat cultures and we treated them with deisolated ghrelin, we do get a response in some factors, such as GFAP itself. And as I said earlier, some of the cytokines. So it looks like both forms of ghrelin probably is having an effect on these astrocytes. So basically, to sum it up, what I wanted you to go home with today is that the hypothalamic inflammation and gliosis is kind of complicated right now, in my opinion, as to what we are defining as either of these. But we do know that there are direct effects of both nutrients and metabolic hormones, and that there's probably uh, at least two different phases, where the initial phase response is probably beneficial, and then the more long-term response is going to be um, harmful to the animal in metabolic control. And there are probably a number of other different effects of other metabolic factors and nutrients, and the combination of these effects are very important to look at. The duration of exposure, and also some people have gone on to show that you can reverse some of this with um, changing the diet and also with uh, exercise. But I think what we should keep in mind is that these cells are actually playing a very important role in different aspects of what the neurons are doing. And of course, I want to thank our, our group in, in Madrid. Most of this work was done by Esther, Chris, and, and Pilar. And all three of them have been very fortunate to spend time in the laboratories of Tomas Horvath and Matthias Schaub, who I would like to also thank for most of their collaborations in this work. Thank you very much.